Well, good morning, everyone. Let me just by way of announcement say uh, we have now started our service. And so Mark has uh, got everything up and running. Um, if uh, I hope everybody did get the long email I sent out yesterday afternoon. If you did not get it, uh, then that means I probably don't have your email address. So if you'll go ahead and somehow or another get your email address to me, um, I'll make sure that you get it on it along the uh, information that this last week I have been trying to get a hold of people who can tell me for our county and for our city what we really can and can't do. And so according to everything that came in, uh, if you're coming in and out of the building, you have to have your mask on while you're sitting. Out there, you have to have your mask on. But then Dr. Sullivan, who is in charge of, um, of the operational compliance for the health department, called me personally and said, as long as I'm 20 feet, 15 to 20 feet away, I don't have to have my mask on. Now, uh, to be honest with you, if she would have said that I would have had to have my mask on, I was ready yesterday afternoon to say it will be Zoom only. Because to me, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if I have to put my mask on and muffle the uh, everybody in here hearing and everybody on Zoom and YouTube hearing, it would be more important to the Zoom clear than to speak unclear. And so that's what we have today. Um, uh, our governor did say no singing and or chanting. And so that means even from behind masks, and we're gonna be compliant with that. We are gonna do a prolonged season of prayer. Uh, Ann got me this information from First Baptist Church Merced. And so we're gonna do our version of it. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but you will see what we're doing here in a minute. And so there will be a music interlude going on in the background, and I will be leading us in thoughts. But you feel free to pray during that entire time as you would be uh, led to pray. And uh, with all of that in mind, how about if we go ahead and do the right thing and say, today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it and open it up in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you today, either uh, in-house or in our homes, uh, by way later of YouTube, help us to remember again that um, the situation may prevent us all from feeling the ability and having the ability and the, uh, the connection with one another in one room, but help us to never forget that the connection is in Christ, not just inside a room. Father, we could all be underneath the same roof and be completely separated uh, in the what we're thinking, what we're uh, feeling, why we're doing it. So Lord, I would pray that uh, today we would have one purpose, and that is to lift up your son, Jesus Christ, that we would look to him to see uh, what we need to see in ourselves today, that we would look to you and your word to see what you would want to say to us today. And Father, help us to celebrate today. Yesterday, uh, the United States went crazy over the concept of independence. But Father, there is no greater independence than the freedom of sin. And so Lord, help us to celebrate the freedom that comes uh, not just on a battlefield, but on the cross, the ultimate battlefield. And so Lord, help us to, to live and rejoice and help us to celebrate and meditate and study and, and to, to think on these things, whatsoever is good and perfect and perfect and profitable. Help us to think on these things as we worship together today. And as we do, we'll give you all the glory for you and you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. We do have a few announcements today. Uh, tomorrow night, we will have our prayer time. So if you have not been coming, we will meet at 545 in this room for prayer time. It will be set up just like this. I am probably not going to use the visuals. Um, you know, I'm not as tech minded as Wyatt is. And so uh, uh, Wyatt and family are on vacation, but they are on the Zoom. I've already seen that they are watching by way of Zoom. So although they may be on vacation, they are still worshiping with us today. Um, and so tomorrow night at 545, but tomorrow night, the ladies study had already planned to take the, the 4th of July weekend. They will resume next week. Not resume, but resume. Uh, that's a little bit of a play on words there, I think. Okay. Uh, Tuesday night, we will be doing the Zoom Bible study. If you have received any of the Zoom Bible study, uh, Zoom invites in the past, they will still work. Same number, same password. We will start at seven o'clock. 
Uh, last week, we only got through the first four verses of Psalms 8. We have still got five more verses to do because um, we looked at so many of the New Testament. You know, in the New Testament, Psalms 8 is uh, is in five different places of the New Testament. So we were looking at all of those places and saying, okay, what does this mean and that mean and this mean? Does the Son of Man mean David or does the Son of Man mean Jesus? And the answer to that is, by way of topology, both. And so we were studying all of that the other night, and uh, we'll continue it. I think we'll probably finish Psalm 8 on Tuesday night. Uh, let's continue to pray for one another. And let me just ask in the room, are there any other prayer requests and or announcements? Because we're about ready to go into our scripture reading. Any other prayer requests or announcements? Well, if not, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to our scripture reading this morning. King Solomon, you know, many of the Proverbs are by him. And uh, if you've ever noticed, there are 31 chapters of Proverbs, which is pretty close to our average uh, month length of 29 and a half days. It's really handy to just read one of these a day. Uh, I did when I was younger. I'm not as regular with it anymore. But the truisms that are there that coach us through life have such wisdom for us, especially as we represent Christ. A gracious woman gets honor, and violent men get riches. A man who is kind benefits himself, and a cruel man hurts himself. The wicked earns deceptive wages. The one who sows righteousness gets a true, re a sure reward. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord but those of blameless ways are his delight. Be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. Like a gold ring and a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. The desire of the righteous ends only in good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in his riches will fail, fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind and the fool will be the servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Let's pray. Father, as we read these words of wisdom, we remember that Solomon was the wisest man as he observed life and what happened and tied this in to what's become part of our canon. And I pray, Father, to you, uh, our hearts don't naturally do what's good. We don't necessarily even desire it. We look out for ourselves above all. But Father, as we hear these things, it reminds us that you are a good God. You're a God that, that has order to this world. You do reward righteousness. And even when we can't see that happen right away, we know that ultimately, you are a God of justice. I pray, Father, as we observe these things, we won't just try and imitate them because we think that they're good for us in life, but they will remember them because they bring honor to you and we claim you as our Lord and help us to see those things that we don't do that honor you as we strive to live the sanctified life. I pray now, Father, as we're in this fellowship together this morning and online, that our hearts will unite together and be knit together as we seek and pursue you. Thank you for having pursued us. And as we sing uh, in our hearts, as we hear these things, and as we, as singing, our prayers come before you, we'll remember that you hear what's in our heart, not necessarily what comes out of our mouth. We praise you so much for having planned all of the things in this world, your providence, 
and even the COVID virus, all things fit together in your plan as you are a great God. Thank you for having sent your son. Amen. Again, we've never done this before, so uh, this is all brand new for us. I will say that I have done this um, in a different place, in a different venue, and have had it in several venues that I've been in. We're going to have a time of prayer. Uh, how many of us believe that God can cause all things to work together for the good in his time? And uh, how many of us believe that everything that's going on that's crazy in our world right now, God will indeed, in his time, work all things out? And so the song that we'll be playing in the background is that song, In His Time. And as we listen and as we pray, as you think about the words, I'm going to be leading us in the concepts that we can be praying during this time. So if you would, please just go ahead and bow your heads with me, and let's prepare for a season of prayer. If we were to follow the pattern of prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, he said, started off with saying, pray acknowledging God's holiness. And so I'll ask you right now, um, to let's start giving God the, the, the hollowed he deserves. started off by the prayer by saying our father and the only people who can say our father are those who are legitimate sons and daughters of Jesus Christ can we pray right now for those that we may be praying for but we're not sure that they are indeed brothers and sisters in Christ could we pray that they would see even through this video today that Jesus is real sin is real Heaven and hell is real, and now is the day of discipleship. As we think of those family members and friends that may or may not be on the right side of heaven, and Father, only you know, but help us right now to, to pray to you, knowing that unless you enlighten us in our eyes, in our hearts, in our spirits as we study your word, it will just be a, an exercise in academia. Lord, I pray it would be an exercise in holiness. So let's pray that God will open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, we know we have missionaries around the world that are, we, we think we have it tough in Los Baños, but there are missionaries around the world and people around the United States that life is much more restrictive than what we're experiencing here. We pray for our missionaries in the Baja. We pray for our missionaries in Mexico. We pray for our missionaries in, uh, in Africa and beyond. We pray for our pastors that are connected to us in Africa and India and all of their congregations. Let's pray for the outreach of the, uh, the missions that we have and maybe even the missions that we're not even aware that we have through our YouTube.
Father, we pray that you would do a lovely thing, not just in some time, but in your time. And Lord, I would pray it would be this time right now. And all God's people said, amen. I hope you have your Bibles nearby. We're going to go right into our Bible study. And if you do have your Bibles, you know that we are progressing towards the end of uh, Luke chapter 9. And with that in mind, if you were to cross-reference this passage with the other passage in Matthew chapter 8, uh, you would see that where we are in the light of things. Uh, we have been taking a look at Jesus' life, especially in Luke chapter 9. He has done so much in Luke chapter 9, and we're getting near the end of Luke chapter 9. We left him last week in Samaria. He was making his way towards Jerusalem because our text said that he set his face on Jerusalem. Now, let's not forget that when he met with Moses and Elijah, the conversation that Peter and John and James heard them talking about was all of the events that he would soon accomplish do you remember where? In Jerusalem. And so because of what he was going to soon accomplish in Jerusalem, he set his face. Last week I asked you, what are our faces set on? Uh, his face was accomplishing God's will. Our face should be set on accomplishing God's will every single day. Every day we should get up and set our face and say, today will be the day. It's not just the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice, but today I need to be someone that the joy Lord rejoices in. It says that there is more joy in the presence of the angels over those who are redeemed and those who go out into the lost. And, and, and so it's not just the angels. I've heard a lot of people say that that means the angels rejoice. Well, yes, they do. But the text does not say God gets excited because the angels are excited. It says God is the one rejoicing. And because of that, all heaven rejoices with him. We know that Jesus has set his face, and, and I want you to notice, if you look at, at Luke chapter 9, or Luke, the entire gospel, we know that there's 24 chapters. Now, it, we have gone from pre-birth to pre-death in nine chapters, is that correct? And starting in chapter 10, and for the last 14 chapters, it is all the last one month to two weeks of Jesus' life. And so the majority of the book of Luke are the last couple of days that he's alive. And so uh, we have rushed forward in our timeline. And so Jesus has set his face on going to Jerusalem. And as he does, uh, he's talked about a lot of different things. Today we're going to talk about the three distractions of discipleship. Distractions of discipleship. And I'm going to say this, that many times when I have heard these three texts and these three encounters talked about, a certain thing seems to have permeated all of that teaching, and I'm going to try to unpermeate it. Does that make any sense? Okay, so if you have a Bible out, we're going to take them one event at a time. So begin reading with me in Luke chapter 9, verse number 57. And as they were going along the road. Now, what has just happened? What has just happened is James and John has taken a look and said, let's burn them up. So they're making their way from Samaria, and as they're going along the road, someone said to him, now notice it doesn't say who the someone is. Now, that means two different things. Either they're purposely trying to prevent us from knowing who this purpose is, or they might be telling us that because of this event, he's never seen or heard of ever again. Which means what? That, that the call to repentance is today. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put off to tomorrow because we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. In fact, we're not even guaranteed a later today. And so you're going to hear me say over and over again, today is the day for discipleship. Today is the day for discipleship. And as we were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, wait a second. Let's think. Now, we know the story. Where is Jesus going? To Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Is that correct? Why is he going there? To die. To be delivered over into the hands of evil men, the scribes, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. Uh, in fact, uh, even, did you know that the only one of the disciples who said, let's go to Jerusalem and die with him, was Doubting Thomas? Did you ever study that? The only one, when he said we're going to Jerusalem, we said, let's go with him and die with him. 
was Doubting Thomas. So I think sometimes Doubting Thomas needs to be reevaluated in some ways as well. And so he says, I am willing to go with you, and I will go with you wherever you go. And literally, we could read, wherever you are going. We could easily read it this way. I will follow you whatever you are doing. Because we don't just follow someone from point A to point B. We follow someone from thought A to relationship activity B. See, in order for us to follow Christ, we've got to know what the Word of God says and then do it. Faith comes by doing the Word of God. Is that correct? And so uh, we don't follow Jesus from just Samaria to Jerusalem and say, I'm a disciple. It is not a, a unit of distance. It is not a location to location. It is a thought to vocation. And so he says, I am saying, I will follow you wherever you go, whatever you are doing. And it looks like Jesus' response to him is out of place. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so you would say, in effect, Jesus is looking at him and saying, do you really know what you are saying? Do you really know what you are saying? Now, let me just say, Jesus always deals with us completely honestly. So when we say something like, Jesus, I'm ready to do this. Jesus says, do you really know what you are saying? Foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. But if you follow me, you may lose all the creature comforts of life. You ready? You in it for that? You know, if we were to go around the world, and many times on Monday nights, we pray for the, the saints around the world that, you know, here we have to wear a mask. There they're being beheaded. Right? And then we say, oh, no, what am I going to do? I have to wear a mask. And they're standing up for their faith and willingly dying and being beheaded. You know, they're not saying here in, in our town that if we catch you inside that church, we will lock you up and kill you. And yet they are what? They are going forward, unobstructed. And don't get the wrong idea. When Jesus says that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, he's not asking for our pity. He's not saying, oh, look at me, I don't even have a house. What am I going to do? If you follow me, you might not have a house either. Let me read what one commentator said. He says, Jesus does not need your pity. Pity rather yourself. If you have any material possessions in your home or your home that holds you back when Christ wants you out on the open road, witnessing and working for him. I can remember one time I was in a service and uh, the, the, the one word or the one sentence I heard was lighten your load. Lighten your load. It, it, are you so encumbered by your possessions that they can prevent you from doing what God wants you to do? Hear me, whenever he wants you to do it. You know, if we were all to say, let's go and become foreign missionaries, the first thing we have to do is have no debt and be able to walk away from everything in a heartbeat. That means no cars that are technically ours, uh, that we would have to pay car payments if we were to go away. Uh, God wants to know, are you ready to go do everything I would want you to do? Uh, is your load so light that if I called you into full-time service in Tanzania, are you ready and capable of going tomorrow? And if not, readjust your priorities. Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, son of man has not this world. This world is not my home. How many times have we heard Mark pray, Father, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Help me not get caught up in my possessions. Now, we don't hear from this man anymore by pointing him out. But we do know this, that at this event, I believe that all three of these encounters happened right on top of each other. I don't believe they were 15 minutes apart or 15 steps apart. I believe it was just boom, boom, boom. And I'll point that out as we continue. So the first encounter was material possessions. Distractions to discipleship material possessions. How many of us are so possessed by our possessions that they tell us what to do rather than us really using? Now we'll even say, oh no, I've dedicated my home. Oh, no, I've dedicated my car. Oh, no, I've dedicated my motorcycle. And then Jesus says, well, then when you go to this, well, you know, wait a second. I can't afford to give to missions. I can't afford to give to the church. I got a house payment. 
Well, wait a second. You dedicated your house so that you could use your house as an excuse not to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? We need to be ready to, to leave everything. Um, Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nothing preventing or hindering him from doing what God wanted him to do when God wanted him to do it. Now, that does not mean that everybody needs to go out and sell everything you have. But don't be so sold out to your possessions that you can't live out connection with God. Let's take a look at the second one. Beginning in 59, to another he said, now this phrase, another, means another of the same kind in the same conversation. Notice the first one says, I will follow you. He is instigating this fellowship. Notice Jesus is directly talking to this other man. And to another he said, follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And then again, it looks like Jesus' response is a little bit calloused. He said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now let's just stop and think about this just for a minute. Um, if we were to take a look at this, most people believe that uh, this man is being called by Jesus. But don't, don't forget that Jesus sometimes is legitimizing whether this man really wants to follow him or not. Jesus will call. It says, many are called, but few are chosen. Many will see that there are two ways, and they will purposely choose the wide road over the narrow road. Now, God is going to save who God is going to save. But sometimes we can put God on hold. Hear me. We can put God on hold by making some pretty poor choices in the way in which we follow, especially after we have already heard him say, follow me. Now, let me just say this. Spiritually dead people cannot preach the kingdom of God. They can talk about it, but notice what it says. He says, leave the dead to bury their dead. What is he saying? That spiritually dead people can bury physically dead people with no problem. But spiritually dead and physically dead people, what does he say? Cannot proclaim the kingdom of God. And so I believe he's talking to a believer. I, I believe he's talking to a believer and not just calling him into salvation, but into service. Now, Jesus knows that his time is short. And so if he's going to get this man completely discipled up, he needs to follow and he needs to follow when? Today is the day of discipleship. Today is the day of discipleship. Now, you would say, but isn't it a legitimate reason for me to go bury my father? But most people in scholarship believe that the man's father has not died. What he is saying is, is let me go home and wait till after my dad dies. It doesn't even say that dad is sick, but it's, it insinuates that dad is somewhat wealthy. And if I wait until after dad dies, I can wait until after I get dad's inheritance. And then this way, I'll go ahead and fund the whole mission project. And Jesus is saying to the first one, I am not dependent upon earthly dollars and cents and homes. I can do my job without your dad's inheritance. You see how the two just continue to, to grow on each other? But let me e equally say this. Um, even if the man's father was sick, we should use that as an opportunity to shed and spread the gospel, not to shed the spreading of the gospel. One writer said this, he is not making a callous demand on a grieving son, but he's calling to this man to forsake the potential of personal future benefits in light of the eternal loyalties and commitments of the right now. Even family, loyal as they may seem, are temporal and can become hindrances and distractions. The spiritually dead can bury physically dead, but they cannot preach this, the gospel. Disciples should not give priority to tasks that unsaved people can do, maybe even better. Maybe even better.
Jesus said, follow me now. He replies, me first. Me first. I'll follow you, but first, notice what he said. But he said, Lord, let me, let me first. You see, when, when we call Jesus Lord, and I've heard a lot of people say this, that he is either Lord of your life or he's not Lord of your life. Let me just say that, that I don't believe that. I believe he can be Lord of your life, meaning Savior, but he may not be Lord of your life, meaning how we conduct our everyday life. And I'm going to point that out of 1 Corinthians 3 at the very end. But you know what that passage says, that all of our works are going to be put through the fire. And it says that many of us will find out that we have worked in our works, the things that we have done in the flesh, refine and come out as gold and silver and precious metals. But some of our works will be burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble. We ourselves will be saved, but it will get into heaven as if we had smoke on our garments. And so when I take a look at these first two, I can take a look at people who I could say could be legitimately saved. I can't say for sure that they are because the Bible doesn't say that they are. But I don't believe Jesus could look at someone and say, come and proclaim the kingdom if they were not already called to be a kingdom proclaimer. A disciple must make radical commitments even if it means a man will leave his father and a daughter will leave her mother and a mother and father may leave their children because the cost of discipleship may indeed separate familiar relationships. But the first question we have to ask is, am I, am I hindered by the possessions of this world? Am I hindered by the relationships of this world? And then it goes right into the third one. Now, again, uh, this is not just a calloused. Jesus' face is looking towards Jerusalem. So uh, he is just saying distractions can include families. But take a look. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just hold this up there for a second. I've already talked about all of this. And let's go to number three. And in number three, beginning in verse 61, yet another said. Now, yet another means during the same conversation. So we have conversation number one, material, conversation number two, familiar, conversation number three. And yet another one says, I will follow you, Lord. But first, but first gives the impression that he heard the last two conversations. And so hearing the last two conversations, Jesus said, no place to stay. He looks at the other man and says, and I think he has seen through that this man is not just going home to bury his father and coming right back. He is going home to stay. And he says, I'm going to go home, but I'll come right back. I'll be right back. Now, what does right back mean to you? You know, when we lived in New Mexico, uh, my mom and dad had, was having a, 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 a big, big, big lanai built off the porch, off the side of their double wide and the construction guys were there all morning, and they looked at my mom and dad, and they said, we'll be right back. Now, they didn't come back for three or four days. And then when we asked, well, what does right back mean to you? They said, when we get back. And, you know, unfortunately for many of us, right back is not an element of time. It's an excuse to go. I'll get back to you. One of my dad's favorite expressions was, in a minute I will. A minute on what, Jupiter? Uh, I, I never understood that. I, you know, um, I, I never said this to my dad out loud, but every time he said that to me, my answer in my spirit was, you mean never. You mean never. Because I can't remember a time when my dad ever said, in a minute I will, and within an hour or so he did it. Encounter number three, yet another man said, I will follow you, but let me first, now let me remember, num number two man and number three man are both saying, I'm going to call you Lord, but it's me first. 
but let me first say farewell. Now notice he doesn't want to just go home and stay until dad dies. He just wants to go home and say goodbye to everybody. Say, I'm on a mission trip. I'll see you. Uh, one of my favorite stories is about Chuck Swindoll. How many of us know that Chuck Swindoll has a brother and a sister? Anybody know that? And he said that one day when his brother was coming in and he looked at his dad and he said, well, I just want to let you know I uh, decided that God wants to use me in foreign missions and I'm going to be leaving tomorrow. I just came home to say goodbye. And he said that his dad being, you know, the sound savvy businessman that he was looked at his son and he said how much support have you raised and chuck swindoll i actually heard him say this but it's in many of his books but i was actually in a room where he actually said this he said he saw his brother reach into his pocket take out a coin and roll it across the table and it went rinkety 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 you know how they do when they start to fall and it stopped dead and it was one nickel and his dad looked at him and said this is your total support? And he said, I'll never forget my brother saying, isn't it exciting? You see, how many of us would have looked at it and said, but first let me go home and build it up. First let me go home and do this. First let me go home and do that. But first he was ready to go. But he did go home and say goodbye to his dad. Now, as we take a look at this, we're going to discover that even Elijah uh, let Elisha go home and say goodbye to his family. Did you know that? So if we go ahead and we take a look at the next slide, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah allowed Elisha to go home and say goodbye to his family before he actually went and followed him. But let me just say that, that the message of the Messiah was much more important than the message of Elisha. Elisha was a coming army. The message of the Messiah is death and sin, and eternal separation. You see, the Old Testament people could stay connected to God through the sacrifices. The New Testament people, the sacrifice is the only sacrifice. Now, this is how critical it is. If you were an Old Testament believer in the sacrifices in the temple, all the way up until the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross, your Old Testament connection to God would have still got you to Abraham's wisdom. But the second Jesus died on the cross, that was no longer good enough. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and there is no other name under heaven given by men. So that means within a 36-hour a window, it went from being potentially okay with God by the Old Testament sacrifices to now only Jesus and the recollection and the, the, the reconciliation of Jesus on the cross gets me into heaven. So I could go from a saint to a sinner in less than 24 hours. The message of the Messiah is much more urgent than even the Old Testament prophecies because they still had hundreds of years. We've got today. Today is the day of discipleship. Today is the day. You see, the Messiah's message can't wait. If they didn't hear, they could still be connected to God through the Old Testament rituals and sacrifices. Today, if you're not connected to God, you don't get a second chance. We don't go to some in-between situation where somebody might be able to pray us out of it. We don't go into soul sleep until God feels so bad about the fact that people are not in heaven that he just says love wins and lets everybody come. It says we are appointed once to die, and then after that, judgment. Now, judgment doesn't mean just you, negative. It means judgment. Are we going to be silver, gold, and precious metals? Or are we wood, hay, and stubble? Or at, even worse than that, do we not even have wood, hay, and stubble? Because at least the wood, hay, and stubble people get in heaven. The non-wood, hay, and stubble just get completely, completely experiencing the wrath of God forever. Jesus goes on to say this then, I will follow you, but let me first of all say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is not an occasional looking back. I don't know how many of you have actually plowed, um, especially with a horse and a single plow. But in order to plow straight, and unfortunately, I've done this from behind a a four-wheeler, 
But in order to plow straight, you got to be looking forward. Um, one of my favorite adventures is I went fishing one time up to Big Winnie Magosh in Minnesota. Anybody ever hear of the, the, the anybody ever hear of Bemidji, Minnesota? And I went fishing up there because they said the fishing was great up at Big, Big Winnie Magosh in Bemidji, Minnesota. And so I went up there fishing and I rented a great big boat. And, uh, you know, my dad was there and a friend of his was there and his son was there and we were all fishing and having a great time. And uh, for the most part, I was driving the boat. And then the other guy's son says, I want to drive the boat, too. So, you know, we let him drive the boat uh, and we're trolling. Does anybody know what I mean by trolling? We've got our fishing lines in the ground, uh, in the ground, in the water. Uh, we've got the fishing lines in the water and you're supposed to be going a nice slow pass so that you don't tangle up the lines and everything is out there. And many times you want to go straight down this one path and then straight because you never know exactly where the fish are, even with a fish finder. In fact, I think that those things are just, just toys to get us to buy them. There's no fish down there. They just throw it up there every now and then to make us think like it's working. But we're going and we're going and going. And, and as we're going to the far side of the, of the lake, uh, I, I realize we're getting dangerously close to the bank. And I look around and the young man steering the boat is watching the wake and ran our boat straight up on ground. Now, the two dads were so busy thinking, is that a nibble? Is that a nibble? They're not even looking where we're going. I'm in the front of the boat, and, and I can see we're about ready to tum, 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 just eat dirt in the front of the boat. But I thought, I'm just going to let him do it. I'm just going to go ahead and let him do it. If he runs us aground, he runs us aground. He will surely. No one who puts his hand and consistently looks backwards, will do anything but run everybody aground. We cannot plow for the kingdom of God by looking, hear me, continually backwards. He's not talking about just glancing over your shoulder. And so uh, one writer said this, so a disciple cannot live his life or her life consistently looking back to old lifestyles, old friends, old habits, and old places. We will not. It says that we are supposed to be buried together with Christ and rise to walk with him in newness of life. That means the old life, the old habits, the old friends, the old ways are supposed to be in the grave and left in the grave, and the new person is supposed to come out no longer encumbered by any of the old stuff that plows us under if we just keep our eyes on it. We are supposed to be living forward, not living and looking backwards. He says, fit for the kingdom. Now, uh, this does not refer to salvation. He is not talking about uh, you can't get saved and still be in the world. But he is saying this, you can be saved and be so cardinal in your connection that you are no service to the kingdom. So he's not talking about entrance into heaven. He's talking about service in the kingdom. Notice what he says. He says, once you have put your hand to the plow, and again, so many people I have heard say that all three of these people are unsaved people. I take a look at it. All three of these people in my mind could be saved people. Don't just think that all three of these are just, just illusions for not getting saved, but these are distractions that saved people find themselves in. Because if you've put your hand to the plow, I see that as a euphemism for once being saved. But getting saved and then living your life, you know, backing your way into heaven, I'm going to go off the, the video, but for us in here, we, we would say this, I want to go to heaven, but I want to see everything that I used to do as I'm backing my way in. Um, back in the days that I used to, did anybody know I'm, I'm a really good dancer? Now, my feet can't dance at all, but I am a really good dancer. And back in my days when I used to dance and preach, I used to do the moonwalk. But since the moonwalk is no longer popular, and the last time I did the moonwalk at camp one year, a bunch of the kids at camp said, what is that? 
So I don't moonwalk anymore. But isn't this moon trying to moonwalk into heaven? You see, having, having your direction towards heaven, but having your focus on the plow. I, I believe that all of these encounters are just pictures of distractions. Um, if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians. You want to be blind, huh? Stop biting everything. He just finishes the previous paragraph by saying, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, and you also are God's building. Now, that word there for building in verse number nine uh, means that it's a built building that's still under construction. Does that make any sense? You know, um, yeah, he then goes, and then according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I lay a foundation and someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how you build upon it. There is only one foundation and there is no other foundation that can be laid, which is just Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, that's how we live our lives, right? This is an illustration for how we live. Are, are we going to live as if the kingdom and the foundation is precious to us, and we want to build in such a way that, uh, that what we do actually enhances the kingdom and progresses the kingdom and allows the kingdom to continue? I've been watching some movies of Europe recently, and I see these old castles that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old still fully functional and i take a look at the house around the corner that's less than 15 years old and it's falling apart okay. and that's what i see are we building to last or are we just throwing up anything we can throw up it's if anyone builds on the foundation remember we can only build on the foundation of jesus christ as if the foundation is precious or if the foundation is just, well, whatever we can throw up, we'll throw it up. Each one's work will become manifest. It will be made known for the day. And how many of us, if you're looking at that, how many of you have got that, that letter D capitalized on the word day? Anybody see that? He is not talking about just someday or the day that individuals die, but there will be a day of judgment when everything will be manifest and on that day it will be disclosed because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what kind of person you were by what you did now wait a second no 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 you say hey we test out the work each one has done that's right but what is the works we have done who we are how we live how we walk as dave Beebe said to me yesterday how's your walk is your walk is your walk gold and silver and precious stones or is your walk wood hay and stubble straw and notice both can be christians both can be believers both can end up in eternity but is that the way you want to meet god if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives he will receive a reward now i've heard a lot of people say this i don't care about getting a reward when i get to heaven i just want to get in there well if it wasn't important why does paul preach it i want a reward i have no idea what that really means but i used to sing a song in church a long long time ago that says must i go an empty-handed must I meet my Savior so? If I follow that up with passages in Revelation, if I have a crown in heaven, it is not my crown. It is my crown to give him. To give him. Do I want to meet Jesus Christ? And if he does still have nail scars in his hands, when he reaches out his hands for me, do I want to put nothing in? If anyone is built on the foundation, survives, he will receive a reward. But notice verse 15. But if anyone's work is burned up. Now notice his life is saved. But everything he did in his life was either 
material possessions, family relationships, or distractions of direction will be burned up. And that's why I don't call this, uh, in Luke chapter 9, three examples of not following, but three examples of the hindrances that we disciples experience. He will suffer loss. But how does verse 15 end? Though he himself will what? Be saved. He himself will be saved. Now, for some of you, you might say this. That's good enough for me then. As long as I get into heaven, I don't care how I get in. As long as I get in, then you're missing everything else he has said. The person who would say, I don't care. I just want to get in. I would say they are potentially hindered in their building process by possibly one or all three of these material comforts. I'm not really free to do what God wants me to do whenever he wants me to do it. Future financial gains. Well, you know, I, you know just let me live for the future. I, I asked one time a group of people, how many of you would love it if the Lord was to come back right now? And I have had several people say, oh, no, no, I've got a vacation coming up. Just pray that he'll wait till after my vacation. I've got a grandbaby coming up. Just pray that he'll wait till after my grandbaby. I one time heard an evangelist say this, that I know God, and I know God's got a great sense of humor. And here I am, 45 years old, and I've never been married. But I can pretty much guarantee you this, that the day I get married, and before I ever say, uh, finish saying I do when we get to the hotel, he'll come back again. How many of us are basing, basing his holiness on our worldly comforts, our potential gains, and our family and friends' distractions. And how many people of us have, have literally, you can't stop being a Christian, but you can stop being effective in service? Isn't that right? How many have, have become hindered in our effectiveness because of these three? And these are just three examples. These are not all of them. So in closing, let's put some thoughts together. Christ must reign in our hearts without a rival. You don't have to say amen. In fact, um, this week as I was dealing with this, it drove me to silence. Because so many times I hear something, I go, that's right. A amen. But you know, when I hear something that drives me to silence, it's even more significant than just, you know, me saying that's right. That's just me. When God says that's right, I'd be quiet. He needs to be without a rival. All other loves and loyalties must be secondary, and if and when they are not, we will reveal ourselves by the choices and decisions we make. I don't need an amen. It drives me to silence. Discipleship is not a matter of someday. Discipleship is today. Let's pray together. Father, as we allow you to massage your word into our hearts and spirits, I would pray that you would speak clearly. May we answer honestly. May you do a work completely, and may we find you abundantly capable of meeting all of our needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. And as you do, we will give you and you alone all the glory, all the admiration, all the temporary loyalty, all the potential future gain loyalty, all of the Family and friends, loyalty comes first to you. And all of those other things will go strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to put my mask back on because I'm going to interact. And uh, everybody, uh, I think Mark will come back up here and make it so everybody can say hi to everybody. Have a blessed day, everyone.